Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Hello and welcome to the Dementia Care Partner Podcast Series. I'm your host, Greg Phelps, along with Tifa Snow. And Tifa, with all this spare time you have now from uh, not traveling, ha ha ha, um, you're <laughs> able to read even more articles and, and they're sending out mixed messages like uh, statistics. I think there's a saying that goes, uh, figures lie, liars figure. So I'm not quite sure where we are in this. Uh, I was reading stats for the US. Um, persons living in care homes make up 6% of the population, but have suffered approximately 45% of COVID deaths. Canada isn't faring much better. Uh, latest information shows about 81% of our COVID-related deaths occur in care homes. Um, but then I read another study from the States, which again said that it was persons living at risk, persons in care home, around 81% of the total COVID deaths. Sure. So, you know, uh, what do we do with these numbers? How do we process it? Well, so it sounds like in one hand, they said like 45% of all our COVID deaths are people living in, you know, residential care facilities, but maybe it was nursing homes and not adding in the assisted livings or the group homes or congregate living in other phenomena, or maybe it was, and they're looking at other numbers than the ones, maybe they're just looking at recent numbers. Because if we look at numbers over the long haul, what we found is, I mean, the, the information that I know says early in this pandemic, there were many more people out in the public sector who got serious symptoms of COVID and often did not seek medical support in a, in a fashion or a time frame that gave a window of opportunity to start doing some prophylactic, some things that would help get through that. And by the time they were seeking assistance, the virus had replicated and was taking over the whole the system if they were vulnerable. So it could be that, you know, if we look at recent stats, that I would agree that people in care homes, the vulnerable group is at, appearing to be at a much higher rate risk of developing both serious symptoms, but also morbid, they, they're more likely to die from it than people who are in the general population. Um, but still, there's a pretty remarkable difference, 45, 81%. I mean, that, that feels really different. So I, I'm wondering, you know, what's the message of the numbers? I mean, if we say 81%, is it that sometimes people who pass away die from things like congestive heart failure and they didn't have any symptoms of COVID, what would you assume if they had congestive heart failure problems and they had diabetes and then what they died from looks like just straight out congestive heart failure getting to a place where the system couldn't support? What would you think, Greg, if that was the case? Well, I, I, I'm really of mixed minds on this. I mean, it, it's one of those things where at the beginning, we weren't even tracking. So, you know, we, we don't even know how accurate the figures are. We, we, we're still doing, what do you call it, the, the swag, um, silly, wild guess, I think is, yeah. well, I can't say that. But I mean, you know, I, I don't think it we is, have an yeah. accurate number. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of our challenges is only people who get tested are counted and only people who get tested and are positive are put in the category. So how many people are out there that get it, don't get tested, never show up in the positive category. And yet, because this more recent thing I just read like yesterday says, you know, about 40, over 40, 45% of everybody in long-term care in nursing homes or in care facilities who get COVID have actually, they're asymptomatic. Which they have means, in, in layman's terms, um, they, they're not displaying any symptoms. No, it's but they're normal, infectious. But they are infectious. If, nice. you, if nobody would know unless you tested them. Well, why would you test them? Well, because we're testing people. And it's like, okay, so when you test them, there's nothing going on with them other than they're infectious. So if we house them in a space where other people are also positive and infectious, but no symptoms... Does that make sense? Or do we need to individually isolate them? What's the value of that? And what's that gonna do for staff who are trying to care for multiple people now? We're talking about 40% who have no symptoms. They're fine moving about. They're just, they are infectious to people who don't yet have the virus. 
So, so here's a simple solution, Tifa. Why don't we just get everybody to wear a mask? Oh, well, hmm. well, the challenge with that one is people living with dementia who are in some of the more advanced states, for sure, don't like things they don't like. And what they don't like, they won't tolerate. And so you put the mask on and they'll try to get it off. If you try to put the mask on, they will strip it off. If you keep doing that, and your job is also to help me clean up after an incontinence episode or eat my food, guess what? I don't like you. I don't want you. I don't want you near me. And now I've made the care routine difficult, if not impossible. And if you're doing something I don't like, you're in front of me. I'll reach out and start to do things to your mask, to your visor, to your things, because I don't like you anymore and I don't trust you anymore. It's hard enough to like you and trust you when you look like a bandit. I mean, we're we're asking people who the primary reason they've been placed in this situation is to get assistance and care and to socialize to figure all this out and be agreeable. Now, wouldn't it be nice if there actually was a simple solution to this? Are there any sort of is there any advice you can give? Because people are are desperate for some sort of guidance. And unfortunately, there's no one size fits all with this. No, there aren't. And I think what it goes back to, Greg, for me is we learned a good long while ago that for dementia, we need person centered. I mean, we really need to focus on that individual. What are their values? What do they care most about? Who's around them that can support them? What's the most vital thing about them? Because it's not how long you live for many people. It's how you live. And if I'm a risk taker and I've always been a risk taker, then and I don't have symptoms, I'm thinking I go with what makes sense for TIPA because TIPA and probably Greg and maybe a few other people are very likely to be more invested in being able to hang out with the people they like and know and take a little risk that, you know, your COVID and my COVID vary a little bit and maybe I'll get something else. But, you know, I was happy when I died. I mean, that's going to be for some of us. That's it. For other people, it's like, I don't trust these people. I don't want them around me. Then they need to be provided with alternatives and options in my mind that better suit what their primary values are. But it doesn't mean that someone from somewhere imposes all of this on everyone, because then, as they say, you try to please anybody, everybody, nobody's happy. And I think this isolating everyone, it really, when half of us are asymptomatic, I don't think that makes sense. Keeping us in a space and a place pretty much where people who are also in that same category, be they staff or be they other residents, that might make sense, or maybe they're even family members, but being cognizant of the care people who are involved in this also are human beings who deserve as well to be considered in this mix. Now, Canadians have always viewed Americans as being a little more litigious than we are. Um, Are there going to be lawsuits as a result of this? Because I can be safe, you know, I, I, I put her in there because you guys are the medical people. Well, yeah, not only are there going to be lawsuits, we've already got people lining up to make new laws or legislative issue, you know, variations to keep that from happening. And, you know, there was a big backlash because it basically said anything that that we consider frivolous won't count. And it's like, well, what's frivolous? Well, that somebody died during this. And it's like, well, but if they died because nobody, you know, did care, I don't know that that's a frivolous lawsuit. Well, you know, but there was COVID in the building. Well, but they didn't have COVID. It was because their dementia had progressed and they needed assistance with all meals and all they got were a few bites because there wasn't enough staff to go around and there wasn't enough PPE to go around and it's like well see but that's not our fault because we couldn't get the PPE and it's like understood it's not your fault that you couldn't get PPE that that goes elsewhere but the fact that nobody said we've got to do something and it may mean that We don't keep her in her room. We bring her into a common space where I can help multiple people with hand washing and gowning and gloving myself, but they're in a common space. They're as far apart as I can place them, but I can care for those folks in that setting much more effectively. And so the challenge for me is who's responsible for making that statement that people should be individually isolated rather than looking at situations and going, except if this is the case and this should be a consideration and the 
just the the absence of consideration of people living with various you know states or forms of dementia to me is is just so frustrating because it's not okay for families right. for people or for staff any of them because it's breaking people i mean it's truly breaking them there there are so many things right now that uh, maybe we don't always stop and consider uh, costs are going up because you've lost staff and you have lost residents and I'm not necessarily anxious to put mom in there, but my fixed costs of running my institution are going up. So uh, I wouldn't be investing in a, in retirement homes right at this particular moment. So we're, we're sort of in a perfect storm and we're still, we've got the umbrella. We're still sort of flying around in it. Yeah, we've got that. And what we're hearing more and more is this distrust factor of how this happened. There were already issues with staffing. I mean, there, nobody will deny staffing was already an issue. And people saying that they could offer dementia care without adequate skill building in staff was that more than likely, a lot of the time, buildings and facilities and agencies and organizations that were saying they did dementia care did secured, secured the spaces and locked the door and had people watch something, but didn't ensure that there was skill in the, on the part of folks and that they had enough people to actually provide the support and care for the kind of people and the degree of impairment folks had and the support they needed for, for well-being. Um, and then on top of that, we had this pandemic. So we were looking at a marginal system for many people, um, maybe not the high end, but for the medium and low end of, of programs. And now we're looking at people going, I, this doesn't sound like a safe system. I mean, this you're not paying staff enough in many cases that they can just take one job. So they're now working at multiple locations. Um, we didn't have staffing that was consistent on units. So we were switching people from area wing to wing, building to building. Um, we didn't train our staff. So there's more incident where staff were not noticing things that were important to notice. And we didn't have environments that had flexibility in them. So I think what we're recognizing is, man, we had a mess before. Now we have a disaster. Um, Deepa, are, are we able to end our podcast today on a, on a positive note? Can we pick some positives out of this? Because right now it just sort of sounds like confusion and despair. Yeah, I'd say the, the plus that I would say, the only positive is that, you know what? Over 45% of folks who are living in facilities that do get COVID are asymptomatic. Um, so, you know, they're making it through COVID. How are we planning to help them live on with some value and some purpose and some joy in the, in the process? How can we just stop seeing COVID as a stopper and see it as, you know, certain a barrier and a block and something to be concerned and wise about, but not necessarily something that should halt all thinking or halt all programming, um, but making balanced risk guess and, and getting the support of the people involved. So you can say, this is what we want to try Would this. Are you willing to work with me to get to that level of, of support? I mean, there'll be this level of risk. What do you think? And we get people on board that are willing to be on board. And if it doesn't, I say, I need a space and a place for somebody who doesn't want to do this because I, we've got to figure out how to get out of where we are in some fashion. And it could be, I want to be respectful of what you want, but I also still want what I want. Um, and can we come to consensus that we will share some kind of space, but we'll do it as respectfully as we can. And I think respect and communication to me and compassion are the three things we can bring to this and take away from this if we're wise. Tipa, thank you very much. And that's our podcast for today. Tune in again next time.